convene the uh, Ways and Means uh, Committee. And uh, being that I was uh, closed out on the computer, Representative Marquardt, I'm not sure where we left off. Um, so uh, were we at the point where you had presented the bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Yes, we were taking questions. Um, we were in, uh, at the, in, the, in the discussion mode, okay. Yes. Um, maybe uh, the best way to proceed then, uh, Representative Olson, is your sound system working went fairly well? Um, Mr. Chair, can folks hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Why don't you finish up uh, the Marquardt bill being that we were in the middle of it then, if that's all right with you. And then I'll sure, take over the next bill. Okay. Or should, I, or should I jump in? I can finish this one um, if if that helps you just, and then you can start fresh at the next yeah. bill. Okay. It's closed out for a while. Why don't you uh, finish up the bill? And uh, we didn't get a chance to talk in advance, but go ahead. Okay, sounds good, Mr. Chair. Um, so we were at the point of final discussion, and I think we had gotten through everyone uh, that was had their hand up, and we were going to Representative Garofalo for uh, closing comments before our final wrap up from the GOP before going back to Representative Markward, if that's correct. So we'll go to Representative Garofalo. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to um, so thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Chairman Carlson, and uh, the DFL for letting the Republicans get together and have a meeting privately. I just wanted to make sure that people were uh, understanding uh, the context. Is I don't know if any other Republicans have questions. I would just, um, Madam Chair, if we could just, just give one last shout out to those members to see if they have any questions regarding the new information they were given. If not, then I'll just give a closing statement. But sure. I don't see anyone okay. raising their hands. So it looks like. Any discussion from anybody at this point? Further discussion on House File 4673 as amended. Representative Graffalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And so Representative Marquardt, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to listen to our input on this bill. Uh, obviously, uh, this is an important matter in terms of the federal guidance of uh, the assistance. Uh, thank you for incorporating the June language to get some of that money uh, out the door to our local jurisdictions that are incurring these costs. Uh, and many times, uh, getting reimbursement is important, but also they have cash flow issues, particularly with the the level of property taxes being paid or not being paid right now. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I also want to uh, congratulate you on making the smart decision to kind of take some of those funds and set them to the side into a merit-based program. I, I would like to have further conversations with you about that in terms of uh, determining merit uh, and the grant-based uh, grant program, but I think it's wise that you chose to withhold those funds and that was a, a, a good idea. Uh, I do want to highlight a a significant issue of concern that's in the bill. And again, I, I'll be voting in favor today and I would encourage all members of the committee uh, to be voting in favor of it. Uh, but it's the issue of the apportionment to Hennepin and Ramsey counties. And I don't, uh, I don't fault members of Hennepin and Ramsey County for advocating for their districts. In fact, I would expect they would. But the way this bill is designed right now, uh, what will happen is Hennepin and Ramsey get their allocation uh, their per capita allocation based on population. And then for the other 85 counties, not only the city portion of those funds, uh, but also that $100 million that Chairman Marquardt has put to the side, those pockets of those funds all come out of the 85 county allocation and are distributed to the other two counties when either through the $100 million they apply for or for all the cities. So I believe I was looking at the documents uh, right, but in the city allocation, and, and perhaps I should defer to nonpartisan staff to make sure that I read this right, but I see that in just the city allocation, $65 million is gonna go to Hennepin County, even though they already are getting the full county allocation, and the $28 million is going to Ramsey County. And that's the numbers I got from the, the spreadsheet, but I wanna make sure that I'm reading right, uh, either for, or nonpartisan staff, or um, Ron, can you please confirm if those numbers are, are accurate for me? Representative, or uh, Mr. Marks, would that be best directed to you? Perhaps Ms. Dalton. Oh, Ms. Dalton, yes. 
Mr. Stoughton. Um, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I believe that is correct. Okay. And so uh, again, um, Madam Chair and members, it's important that we, as a House member and as a legislature, we prevent it. We present a united front. And I understand that Chairman Marquardt has a more complex decision-making process than some of us do. Uh, and, and I appreciate that. However, um, this is something that DFL members, I would really like you to address privately before we go to the House floor on this bill. Um, the per capita allocations for Hennepin and Ramsey in a time of a crisis like this should not be uh, this level of um, disproportion. And I, I hope that our friends in the Senate and the public don't take our affirmative votes in this matter as saying that we are validating or okaying that distribution process because we really, um, that level of disparity really should not be taking place. And so uh, with that, again, Representative Marquardt, I just want to thank you uh, for reaching out to us and working with us on this. Uh, these are intended to be for used for local funds. I want to congratulate you for not uh, cutting the number down and trying to spend the money in our own way that we're trusting our local partners or getting the money out the door. And I look forward to working with you on this in the short term and in the future. But I would just emphasize for, uh, for, I, for you and for other members of the majority party, uh, please take a look at that city issue and that $100 million issue in terms of its, um, its allocation. I do, I do think there's room for improvement. Thank you, thank you Ms. And Madam Chair and Representative Marquardt. Thank you. Uh, seeing, we'll go to uh, Representative Marquardt for further closing comments and to renew your motion. Well, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Garofalo. I appreciate that very much and your input on the bill and all the members' questions and concerns. And I, I know we don't usually hear from other folks, but I know Commissioner Bowerly, who is kind of the point person on this, is is on the line, and I don't know if it would be appropriate to have her say a few words, Madam Chair, before I made my closing comments. Sure, Representative Mark Roach, sure. Uh, yes, Commissioner Bowerly. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Chair Marquardt uh, and uh, members of the committee. I appreciate the, uh, the leave to just offer a few thoughts from uh, the administration. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, Chair Marquardt and uh, Representative Garofalo uh, for having conversations about the use of these funds. We completely agree that it is important that we distribute at least some of this money very quickly. We know that our local government partners have been incurring costs and the work that they do on behalf of their residents is uh, always essential work and services and that's especially true now. Um, however, I would uh, note that we there's a lot we do not know yet about this pandemic. Uh, it's been compared uh, that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, I would not know uh, about running a marathon, but it's my understanding it's 26.2 miles and then it's over. I think the difference between the pandemic and a marathon is we don't know when it will be over. Uh, the virus has mutated uh, and we are working uh, across the state of Minnesota as new developments occur every day and every week. And so uh, we would encourage uh, reserving more than $100 million for a future uh, sort of need-based allocation uh, we would recommend that we push out about half of the money now on a per capita basis, and we reserve the other half for needs that uh, will show themselves as we move forward in time and as the uh, state needs to respond. Um, we know more. We will know more tomorrow than we do today. So, reserving at least half of this for future distribution will allow us to respond uh, to that changing situation. So. Um, Again, I appreciate uh, so much the work of uh, Chair Marquardt and thank you for the opportunity to make a few remarks. The administration uh, believes we can best support the work of all towns, cities and counties and all the residents of Minnesota uh, as we move forward by providing approximately $330 million uh, now on a per capita basis to 85 counties and other jurisdictions over a certain size and then reserving a future amount uh, for future decisions as we know more about the virus's spread. I would just note uh, for a piece of, uh, a note of context, the state at this point has appropriated about $550 million total 
for all of the response efforts across the state. So that's by state action, the uh, gathering of the PPE and procurement efforts, the distributions to hospitals and to schools, the, uh, there are conversations about um, uh, small business loans that I know are moving through legislative conversations. We've expanded states food security programs and uh, sent uh, money out to local government public health. And so I think, uh, send, and so the number of pushing out 330 million now to local governments for their response work uh, is certainly uh, um, not inconsistent with the fact that the state itself has spent uh, through allocations and appropriation and approval through the LAC process has spent $554 million total thus far. So we look forward to working uh, with the legislature as we move forward and appreciate the time so very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Chair Marquardt, uh, and Representative Garofalo for your work on this. Representative Marquardt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Again, thank you to Representative Garofalo and other members who uh, provided input. And just, you know, on the Hennepin and Ramsey uh, question, which I, you know, know is a, a point of debate. You know, it is the one and only place in the statute where they, you know, provide specific guidance on and in the law on where those dollars would go. And it said for local units of government exceeding 500,000 population, and that is a direct appropriation, direct allocation that um, those counties have already received and are spending. And I just think there's some question as to, and even on May 11th, there was a question and answer session where you had the secretary or the assistant of the secretary of treasury there before NCSL conference. And kind of the answers were both kind of both ways on whether or not a state could determine where those dollars go. And yet in another place, they say those um, allocations were, what do they say, certified separately to be distributed directly to those governments, and they, Hennepin and Ramsey, are responsible for their full allocation, and states would not be responsible for the misuse of funds by those jurisdictions, which sounds like it's pretty autonomous, those dollars that go out. So it's unclear, and you know, this bill, there's no dollars that you know specifically go out to Hennepin or Ramsey County. And uh, we want to get those dollars out quickly. And I, and I just, with a lot of questions, I, I think this is the best way to do it. And the final thing I really want to say is that by leaving money off to the side for those grants, that really there are no caps for any local unit of government, no caps, unlike some of the other proposals. For example, if the city of Wilmer or Pelican Rapids or Worthington who have meat processing plants, if for some reason, you know, maybe they're doing contact tracing or testing and whatever, they could go, um, right now, Wilmer, for example, gets a million dollars under this scenario. But even with another 740,000, they would be up over an $87 cap, which is in another plant. So there's no limit and that could be the same for a county. So there could be a county, should they, should they have real problems that their cap could go over what Hennepin or Ramsey is right now. And, and so there, again, so that's I think a strength of this program is that it can be flexible and responsive to get to those areas uh, where there might be the greatest need. So members, this is important. I, I appreciate folks support discussion on this. Um, we've got a lot of everyday heroes out there uh, on the front lines that we need to get funding and help our cities and counties and townships get that funding to them and, and help um, with economic security for folks and also to fight this COVID-19 pandemic. So members, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Marquardt. Since calling for last discussion and giving the final word to Representative Marquardt, we do have two additional hands up. So we'll we'll honor that and take those members, but if you could please be brief, um, that would be appreciated. So Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Marquardt, for your effort on this bill. And I just wanted to comment with regard to uh, uh, Commissioner Bowerly's last comment about wanting to hold back more of the money from the initial distribution. And I think it's important that we do get a greater percentage 
out to the uh, local communities and allow them to know the resources are there if they need it so that they can start planning for such things as a primary election and in the fall election. Uh, maybe there's some things they need to do that they can't afford to do to ensure that, that the uh, public is safe in their endeavors and interactions with City Hall and or other locations. So that's just one example, but I would uh, support uh, the, the larger distribution as you have it in your bill. Representative Marquardt, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hamilton, briefly. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Byerly said that this uh, virus is mutating. I'd just like her to send me the information that supports that state. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, back to Representative Mark Court. Would you care to renew your motion, please? Uh, yes, I would like to make sure I get this site. Renew my motion that House File 4673, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Right. The motion is before that, so we'll have Ms. Sparkman please call the roll. Representative Carlson. Aye. Carlson, aye. Representative Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo. Yes. Garofalo, aye. Representative Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Davids. Aye. Davids, aye. Representative Daphne. Aye. Daphne, aye. Representative Driskowski. Aye. Driskowski, aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton. Aye. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman. Aye. Hausman, aye. Representative Hurtas. Aye. Hurtas, aye. Representative Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Kresha. Kresha, aye. Kresha, aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly. Aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Long. Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani. Aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt. Aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor. Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski, excused. Representative Poppy, excused. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Scott. Scott, aye. Scott, aye. Representative Torkelson. Aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative Vogel. Aye. Vogel, aye. Representative Wiginius. Aye. Wiginius, aye. 27 ayes, zero nays. Anybody who didn't get a chance to vote? Looks like we got everybody accounted for. So on 27 to zero, the motion prevails and the bill is on its way to the general register. Thank you, Representative Marquardt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Really appreciate that. Yes, and thank you, uh, Representative Olson, for uh, <clears throat> coming to my rescue when my computer froze up. And I keep crossing my fingers as we move forward today. Uh, the next bill on the agenda is House File 1050, Representative Moran. Uh, dealing with child foster care and background studies. And uh, Representative Olson, would you uh, care to make a motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move the Health and Human Services Finance Division report for House File 1050. Okay, this one is a finance uh, division report. Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Olson. Mr. Chair, I move that House File 1050 as amended be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Uh, Representative Moran, 
Would you uh, care to explain the uh, bill? And yeah. I understand. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Representative Moran? Okay, yes. I lost you temporarily there. I hope I'm not having trouble again. No, that was me. I was on another call. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Maybe that was the, what happened. I, uh, I'm a little nervous right now today with my computer, um, which has nothing to do with your presentation. I just got froze out this morning. Um, so, Representative Moran, we're at the point uh, where uh, the motion before us um, is uh, that the uh, bill be recommended to be placed on the general register. And um, we were at the discussion stage. So, if you would care to explain the bill. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, Chair Carson and members. Okay, so the main purpose of this bill is to bring Minnesota foster care licensing standards more in line with our adoption standards. Under current law, our foster care licensing standards and processes create many more barriers for individuals, including relatives, than our adoption standards. So these inconsistencies create problems for placing children in permanent safe homes and isn't good for family preservation. This bill also brings Minnesota in line with current federal policy and recommendations relating to foster care licensing and background checks. I tr truly believe that it's time for Minnesota to rethink the way we license foster care providers Unlike other providers requiring a DHS license, family foster homes are not a business. They should not be, they should be a safe haven for children who can't live at home. And of course, for communities of color, the statutory barriers in our current foster care licensing statutes have a greater impact. So this law here will help uh, remedy that disparities. So when children cannot live with their relatives in foster care and stay connected to their families, they have, when they can do this, they have better long-term outcomes, including higher high school graduation rates, a decrease in, it decreases the risk of mental health disorders, and there's less overall trauma. And COVID-19 has made family visitation for children within the child welfare system more difficult, increasing access for relatives to attain foster care license during this time will make it easier for children with both to both remain with families, but also see families more often and consistently while they are in the system and out of home displacement. This bill has huge support. It is supported by the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administration, the County Attorney Association, several private adoption agencies, Hennepin County, the NWACP of Minnesota. There are several tribes and the Indian Child Reference Center that is supporting this bill, the Aspire of Minnesota and many constituents across a breadth of experiences and perspectives. And it provides a well thought out and negotiated balance to ensure both the safety for children, but also a more reasonable list of barriers that doesn't exclude, that doesn't exclude many foster care providers who have an imperfect past. Um, I would like to just end by saying that this is a bipartisan bill. It is uh, supported by um, uh, Representative Albright, Schumacher, Cresha, and Hamilton. Um, and it has been a well thought through process that really is about the safety of children, but also just eliminating the inequities that we see between um, foster care providers and uh, foster care standards in the adoption standards. 
And I just hope that I can get the support of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you. You're welcome, Ann. Is there any discussion? Uh, Representative uh, Garofalo, did you want concluding comments or? Because um, Representative Albright is also interested in commenting. Yeah, I will wait, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I did not see that. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, Representative Moran and the stakeholders to this bill for the hard work of, of putting together a bill that supports children and families in a better way. Um, it's vitally important that we protect those most vulnerable amongst us. And I think this goes a long ways towards making sure that uh, children who are our greatest asset uh, are taken care of in a meaningful way and respected for the opportunities that uh, we can provide them going forward. So thank you again, Chair Moran. And represent Raffle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and either for the author or for uh, our nonpartisan staff. In reading the bill, it appears that while there's cost to this bill, we're not appropriating any funds. Is it fair to say that we are requiring the department to absorb these costs? Representative Moran. So, uh, rep uh, thank you, um, Chair Carlson and Representative Garofalo. Um, so the, the thing, the, the, the best part about this bill, I believe myself, is that it turned out to have, in the beginning, uh, a fiscal note of about, I think, 120, 140K. And uh, in the Health and Human Service Finance Committee, we was able to add an amendment onto this bill, which brought that cost down to like, I believe it's at 68K right now. Uh, in 2020, I think in 2021 at 78,000. So yes, yes, Representative Garfield. I believe that we can move this forward uh, keep kids safe and uh, and uh, allow uh, the department to find ways to move this forward. Representative Graffel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Nonpartisan staff, if they could elaborate, um, confirm that there's no appropriation in this bill and that the fiscal costs are absorbed. Uh, I think Mr. Berg is on. Uh, is Mr. Berg? Available. And Representative Graffalo, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Graffalo, yes, the fiscal note, as Rep uh, Representative Moran indicated, still shows a $68,000 net cost in 21 and 78,000 a year in the tails for the purposes of adding one FTE at the department to do statewide coordination training and ongoing technical assistance. Uh, the bill as it stands does not appropriate any funding for that position. Rep. Sam Garofalo. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, I think uh, Obviously, um, I'll be voting uh, in favor of today's bill, but I do think it's important to point out that in some senses, this is an unfunded mandate to the department. And given the fiscal situation we're in, it's not a good idea, but I recognize that reasonable people can disagree about this and will reach their own conclusion. Thank you. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Representative Olson, would you care to uh, renew your motion? I redo my motion that House File 1050 as amended be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Sparkman, would you uh, take the roll? Representative Carlson? Aye. Carlson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? Yes. Garofalo, aye. Representative Albright? Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Davids? Aye. Davids, aye. Representative Daphne? Aye. Daphne, aye. Representative Driskowski? Aye. Driskowski, aye. Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton? Aye. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. 
Representative Houseman? Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Hurtas? Aye. Hurtas, aye. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Cresha? Aye. Cresha, aye. Representative oh. Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Representative Lilly? Representative Long? Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani? Aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquart? Aye. Marquart, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski, excused. Representative Poppy, excused. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Scott? Aye. Scott, aye. Representative Torkelson? Aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative Vogel? Aye. Vogel, aye. Representative Wigenius? Representative Wigenius. Aye. Wigenius, aye. Representative Lilly? Aye, sorry. Lilly, aye. 27 ayes, zero nays. Okay, the uh, bill uh, is passed. The motion prevails. The bill is passed and on its way to uh, General Peters. And uh, thank you, Representative Moran. Thank you, members, and Chair Carson. Thank you. Um, we now have uh, House File uh, 4611 by Representative uh, Gomez, COVID-19 Emergency Community Relief Grant Program. Uh, Representative uh, Olson, would you care to make a motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 4611, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Um, I understand there's an amendment, the A4 amendment. Uh, Representative Gomez, do you want to take the amendment and then explain the bill? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Olson. Uh, Mr. Chair, the... sure. Yeah, I move the A4 amendment for the author. Okay, that uh, amendment is uh, before us. Uh, Representative Gomez, if you could uh, explain the amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair. So um, the A4 uh, is the result of some questions that we received in the first hearing, which was in the um, in the Jobs and Economic Development Committee. It adds language about reporting um, quarterly reports to the Commissioner of Human Services um, by the entities, the community action partnerships that are distributing the grants. Okay, so the gist of the amendment uh, report. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? Uh, seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, Representative Gomez, uh, if you could uh, explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, so as the chair mentioned, this uh, House File 4611 establishes the COVID-19 Emergency Community Relief Grant Fund. Um, we are in the middle of an unprecedented economic crisis, as everyone on this committee knows very well. Um, we're all hearing from our constituents about the pain being felt in the communities that we represent. Um, 650 million of our Fellow Minnesotans have filed for unemployment. We basically have erased all the progress that we've made in adding jobs to our economy over the past decade since in recovery from the Great Recession of 2008. And that's over two months. Um, again, 70% of our economy is driven by consumer spending and with so many people out of work and the resulting lost wages and income, um, there's a real threat to our long-term economic outlook. And working class people were struggling before COVID. Um, even as the stock market has surged over the last 10 years, um, wages have stagnated. Um, while unemployment was at record lows, 
unemployment in communities of color and indigenous communities was twice that of white people. Um, and, you know, we find ourselves in a situation of increasing economic inequality where 40% of families in the country couldn't withstand an unforeseen $400. Um, so the feds have responded to um, the COVID crisis and the underlying economic issues with unprecedented stimulus to keep people and businesses afloat during this uncertain time. Uh, the, there was the Paycheck Protection Program for businesses and a number of, of measures to help bolster individuals, including pandemic unemployment assistance, um, the unemployment insurance top off of $600 a week through the end of July, an extension of unemployment and stimulus checks. Um, as we found with the, you know, with the payment, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, a lot of small businesses were passed over by that program. Um, businesses with professional services were able to apply for the funds, and they were quickly depleted. And so, with Executive Order 2015, Deed established the Small Business Emergency Loan Fund to supplement the aid from the federal government and get resources into businesses that had been passed over. House File 4611 takes a similar approach to the places where the stimulus falls short by getting a small one-time cash grant into the hands of Minnesotans who are left out of existing programs. These one-time payments are intended to help them pay rent, utilities, food, and needed household goods. These are dollars that will immediately begin to circulate in our communities. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a, or I guess I didn't mention this yet. So it's a $50 million relief fund. Um, grant funds, it, it, is funded, it is funded from the general fund. Grant funds are to be split equally between the metro area and greater Minnesota. Um, the funds will be provided to individuals who are experiencing a financial hardship as a result of COVID-19 um, and are not eligible for other programs, including those who have experienced job or wage loss but can't file for unemployment those who rely on income from tips or earnings not included in unemployment calculations, and those who will not qualify or will face significant dif difficulty receiving other federal or state assistance, including stimulus payments. Maximum grant award will be $1,500, up to $1,500. Um, and individual awards are, will be um, given out based on needs and resources available. So the bill was drafted to most quickly and efficiently get these funds into the hands of individuals and families who need it the most. The grant funds will be awarded by um, the Department of Human Services to the community action agencies. Community action agencies are statewide and already have an infrastructure for distributing funds to individuals and families with need. Um, and they will make um, grants to qualifying individuals either on their own or through subgrants to agencies serving culturally specific communities, um, which will ensure that the funds are accessible to all, particularly those communities who are disproportionately um, impacted by the economic downturn. Um, so this bill is designed to alleviate pressures on families um, who are supporting adult children um, or elder or elders or other um, family members with disabilities. If you're if you're counted as, an, as a dependent of, of somebody else, you didn't qualify for federal stimulus payments and the person claiming uh, an adult or actually anybody over 17 also didn't, didn't qualify for any payment for them. Um, this bill will help support high school students who relied on their jobs to save for college or to support their families, but lost jobs due to this crisis because high, if you're enrolled in high school, you're not eligible for unemployment. This bill will support tipped workers whose unemployment payments do not reflect the full amount of their wage loss. And um, it will help, uh, a specific, especially college students, um, mixed status families, and other new Americans um, who fall through the gaps. In the submitted testimony, you can find stories of individuals and families who would be eligible for these funds. And um, that concludes my introduction of the bill, Mr. Chair. Okay, any uh, discussion? Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you to the bill's author. Um, I want to go to the bill language here so I can get the correct line for you. On line 2.1, it says um, that the eligible individuals would be those that will have significant difficulty getting COVID-19 related federal funds or assistance. Could you define for me significant difficulty? I'm not sure what that means. 
Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Scott. Um, so there are there are two things. I, I mean, we're basically like people who are just left out of the program. So those who are adult dependents, for example, um, or other minor or college age dependents, people who are excluded because of um, certain uh, immigration statuses, um, certain kinds of visas are not included in, um, in the stimulus payments. Um, people who are not required, you know, kind of goes through them, people who are not required to file taxes and adults who are elderly or disabled but not receiving social security benefits. So there's a number of kind of categories of individuals who are, who are not able to qualify. And so this was designed to, um, to kind of be an option for people who were disqualified for various reasons. Representative Scott. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so, so um, another question, I guess, would be, you know, community action has had, you know, a history of, uh, well, embezzling funds and misusing funds. And so I'm wondering what safeguards, specific safeguards are in here, other than just a quarterly report of the funds, um, what other safeguards do we have for some accountability built into this bill? It's $50 million, that's a big chunk of money. Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Scott. Um, I, I guess I'm aware of, of some issues with the Minneapolis Community Action Partnership, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, I'm not aware of other reporting issues with community action partnerships. You know, these this is like a, a statewide network of organizations that are, that are um, committed to alleviating poverty in communities across the state. Um, they administer programs like energy assistance for the federal government. Um, they help people apply for medical assistance, Minnesota Care, SNAP. They run Head Start programs. They run community um, food distribution programs. They help folks file their taxes. Um, and so <laughs> I guess I, I'm there is an established relationship between the Department of Human Services and the Community Action Partnerships, and um, I'm not aware of any of any other uh, kind of issues outside of the Minneapolis um, problems from a number of years ago. And I have some um, Matt from DHS is on the call, and. Um, Francie, I believe. So I don't know if they have other uh, anything else to add about the way that um, about the way that the relationship between the Department of Human Services and the Community Action Partnerships um, goes like in terms of oversight. Representative Scott. Uh, oh, I thought um, uh, the bill's author was asking a question, asking someone from DHS to take a stab at if the like, site question. And uh, if you would I'd like a further answer, we can do that. Uh, I've got several names here. Uh, Representative Gomez, who was it that you referred to? Uh, Matt Burdick and Francie Mathis, I think, are on the line. I'm not sure if one of them. Um, um, why don't we start with uh, Matt Burdick, if he's available. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague, Francie, who um, can speak to this. Okay, however you want to handle it, that's fine. Uh, is she available? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the, um, my name is Francie Mathis from Department of Human Services, and um, our office has uh, a long history of working with community action agencies um, after the Minneapolis uh, situation, the legislative auditor did um, a big audit of all of the community action agencies because of that, um, that issue and uh, found that there, was, there were no other issues in the community action agencies. And that was a few years ago. But we have, um, our office has a team that works specifically with community action agencies. There's a, a robust monitoring process and um, 
um, our office attends the uh, monthly meeting with all of the CAP directors. So we have like a high touch with community action agencies. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And one final question to the bill's author is um, where, where would the $50 million be coming from since, and I know it's the general fund, but um, on a larger scale, where would the money be coming from since we're in a deficit situation? Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Scott, um, for asking the question. Um, I know that there's going to be an immense strain on the general fund moving forward and really difficult decisions to be made. And I know that you all discuss that in this committee um, frequently. So the idea with this bill is really, um, you know, as our leaders negotiate the budget during the end of session, I, I really believed strongly that that this idea of doing of taking steps to supplement the household economies of Minnesota really needed to be in the mix as we're making decisions about about um, investments in our community moving forward. So, you know, I really think that this is designed to be kind of a tool in the toolbox to address unmet needs in our communities. And I really think that we need to be using the limited funds that we do have as a state to fill in those places where the federal stimulus has failed to reach the families who need assistance. So, you know, this idea, it has a, it has a high price tag. And the reason for that is because I, I, didn't, I don't think that in our policy responses to issues that it benefits anyone for us not to acknowledge the scale of the issue. So you know, $50 million sounds like a lot of money, but it, but in terms of satisfying the, the needs in our community, it's relatively modest. Uh, that being said, this idea is, is scalable. Um, one of the benefits of using the community action agencies as a distribution mechanism is that there is a, an established formula and statute for distributing those funds to community action agencies across the state. So it doesn't kind of change the, um, the mechanism if the bill ends up being, you know, for less money than it is in its current written form. Um, but yeah, I basically just thought it was really important that this idea be in the mix for, um, you know, the, the decisions that are being made um, for how to help families and individuals in our communities out um, during this time. I think uh, Representative Goma has uh, answered the uh, question very well. I would just chime in and say, uh, in conversations that I've had with Representative Gomez and others, uh, the goal is to uh, keep the issue uh, moving forward, being that we're in the very last days of the session, so that uh, the issue of the needs that uh, Representative Gomez described can be part of uh, any discussions as the uh, final budget is uh, put together. And uh, so uh, with that, I'll um, stop my comments and ask Representative Scott if you had any further questions. Otherwise, we've got a couple more members that have got uh, questions or comments. Representative uh, Scott? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I'm good. Thank you so much to the yes. author and for your latitude, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Gomez. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling to really see where the need is that you're trying to identify your representative Gomez. I mean, we've got, um, we've got COVID-19 programs coming from all over the place. I can't imagine um, how people are not uh, able to be uh, uh, reimbursed for a portion of their losses uh, so far, those that actually have losses. We have to realize that some people in our communities haven't had losses from uh, this COVID-19 um, uh, thing going forward. People who are deep into our welfare programs are largely taken care of by our government. Uh, that has gone un uninterrupted. And uh, as we know, our government benefits in this state are very, very rich uh, and and uh, plentiful. Uh, and so um, I, I struggle to really see uh, where uh, somebody is out money because of COVID-19, at least in these areas that you have identified. Uh, here, a, a few questions. Um, first, um, 
would any of this money be going to any of the people who uh, would have gotten the $1,200 uh, per person from the federal government uh, that is uh, is being sent out uh, as we speak? Representative Gomez. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Dreskowski. Um, this is designed to um, step in for people who would not be eligible for the $1,200 stimulus for various reasons. Mr. Chair? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Gomez, uh, so uh, would illegal aliens be uh, in line to get any of this money? Representative Gomez? Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Dreskowski, um, illegal alien is not a term that is acceptable in my estimation to be applied to people who are living in our communities. This, this bill does, um, does help um, individuals with certain um, legal statuses, including people on H-1B visas, um, people with um, lawful permanent status and mixed status families um, who are kept, who are excluded from, um, from COVID related um, relief payments because of the policies of the federal government. And I understand like that, that we're not going to agree on this issue, Representative Drazkowski. You and I actually do agree on, on some unlikely things sometimes. Um, but what we, I understand that you might object to people being in this country um, without lawful status. Um, I wanna point out to you that there are many people without lawful status in this country who are sick with COVID-19 right now because they have been helping, because they're essential frontline workers, because they've been helping to keep our food system moving, because they've been working in meat packing plants in really difficult and unsafe conditions to keep uh, us all fed. There are people who are picking food in, um, in our fields around the country who do not have lawful status, but these are human beings who are in our communities, who go to our schools, who, who, who patronize our businesses, and who are suffering. And so I guess I would just ask you in this moment of extraordinary challenge to our country to really like step into our shared humanity with people. Um, people who we're living side by side with. And the disease doesn't care. This, this, this disease can pass um, across people with different um, immigration statuses and different citizenship statuses without regard for, for any of those issues. And so, you know, again, I, I, I know that we're not going to come to accord about immigration in this conversation, but this is a, these are individuals, um, undocumented people in our country pay taxes, they pay sales taxes, they pay um, property taxes. Many, many undocumented people and families pay, um, pay income taxes using individual tax identification numbers, which I'm sure that you're aware of. Um, and so, and, and they don't get, you know, they'll pay social security taxes and never collect a dime of that. Um, the reality is that people are suffering in our communities. And so we need to, we need to help out where we can. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Sounds like a yes. Um, Representative Gomez, uh, on the very end of the bill, uh, you allow up, to, you allow 10% for administrative costs out of, you know, $5 million out of $50 million is going to go to these agencies. That's very exorbitant. Uh, Normally, we see that to be in the five or six percent area. Why are we uh, why are we being extra generous to these organizations? Uh, is that because of COVID nineteen too? Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Dreskowski. Um, so the we did an up to ten percent um, for because you know the there's there are administrative costs to DHS and then there are administrative costs to the community action partnerships who are going to be getting the money out into community. Um, and so that seemed uh, like a, a way to encompass both of those um, of those needs. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Gomez. It, it looks to me, members, like we're seeing a bill here uh, that attempts to go around uh, the structure of all of the uh, many um, generous and uh, um, 
uh, numerous um, welfare programs that we do have already in law in order to uh, get the money in the hands of people who don't qualify uh, for those dollars through that structure. Uh, and for that reason, uh, and uh, others, I'll be voting no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just texted uh, by Ms. Conley that uh, Representative Mariani has had his hand up for some time and his hands up button is not working. So I'll represent, uh, I'll rec recognize Representative Mariani at this point. Representative Mariani. Are you still with us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I trust you hear me? Yes. Oh, very well, thank you. Uh, so uh, a couple things, uh, one is someone um, who uh, 30 years ago, uh, actually longer, <laughs> more like 40 years ago, uh, was a CAP employee. I worked for a community action uh, agency, which by the way, members go back many decades um, in the United States and here in Minnesota, uh, working with uh, low-income communities to combat poverty and to help people um, you know, uh, get to a place where they uh, can, can uh, work and can earn income and support their families. Uh, terrific movement. Uh, that spans a uh, good 50 years or so. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm real pleased to see this bill uh, because it does count on those caps. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I do think that Representative Scott's question was a good question in terms of, you know, what's the accountability? I think that should always be the question in any of our appropriations. And so I trust that, uh, in fact, having those relationships uh, with state government that, you know, those accountability measures are, are, are there and if they're not, uh, we may want to, um, you know, strengthen the bill if it continues moving forward. Um, I, I just want to comment, uh, Representative Gomez and members, that it, it's not at all unusual for states and locals uh, to be far more inclusive than what the politics of Washington, D.C. Uh, allow uh, Washington, D.C. to do. And I, and I, for one, am thankful and grateful for the bipartisan um, investments that have come out of Washington, D.C. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they always get it right. And uh, we know there's a lawsuit right now uh, for uh, U.S. citizens um, who are not able uh, to claim um, uh, in their households um, the uh, distribution of the income support uh, checks uh, because they're married to someone who's not a citizen. Not necessarily married to someone married to someone who's undocumented, just someone who's not a citizen. The point is that the federal government doesn't always get it right. They've got their own politics. Uh, we have our own politics. And part of our politics, I think, in Minnesota is that we understand that um, our communities are communities and uh, that they are communities. And that means that if somebody's hurting in that community, uh, it's going to hurt all of us. And so I, I really think, thank you, Representative Gomez, for coming up with a uh, wiser uh, way for us to make sure that whole communities are being addressed uh, with uh, the support that they need. Uh, because if we don't do that, then Minnesota's recovery is only going to take longer. It's going to go slower um, as we, uh, you know, uh, struggle. Uh, to, to uh, help others who just have no help uh, be able to be part of, of, of the recovery. I think Ag is a perfect example uh, of that, Representative Gomez. There's so many different people. Uh, uh, and we're, we are talking about workers here. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, attempting to uh, paint this as someone who absolutely doesn't work is just not true. Uh, without, uh, our, whether it's H1B, uh, um, uh, H1B, uh, uh, workers or folks with other uh, status, uh, and yes, including some who are unlawful uh, status. Without them, our agricultural sector in, in, in our state just falls apart, and that's just one sector. Um, so the point here, um, I think, is that we have the, the uh, it's one of the beauties of American government, government governance and our structure is that, yeah, there's a strong federalist system, uh, there's also a strong state system. Um, and uh, by extension, local systems uh, in which we're able to make decisions close to the ground that best benefit um, our communities. And, and so I think that's the spirit in which you offered this bill, Representative Gomez, and I really applaud you for it. I, I certainly support 
uh, these efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you're welcome, and uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Gomez, um, in the body of the bill, there are a number of instances where you're talking about uh, obviously a significant difficulty in making ends meet. And I'm just wondering with regard to uh, someone who would uh, request or make application for uh, this $1,500 uh, stipend or a, a grant, how would you go about verifying that they weren't uh, receiving unemployment uh, benefits? How would you go about uh, verifying that they have not received uh, any assistance due to filing taxes for the last two years? How would you go about verifying that uh, an adult, elderly adult, is not receiving any type of Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid benefits? Uh, how would you go about verifying those uh, could you lay out mechanically how that goes about in terms of accountability for the dollars that are expended? Representative Gomez. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Albright, for the question. Um, so this is one of the benefits of using the community action partnerships um, to distribute this money into community is that they have as Representative Chair Mariani um, talked about, you know, they have a decades long history of serving individuals who are, who are low income. And so they, um, you know, they have different income eligibility guidelines for, um, for different programs that they administer. Um, they are coming together to um, determine what the appropriate um, kind of income eligibility is. But they are able to, you know, I mean, when you apply for any kind of program, you have to uh, um, provide documentation of, you know, of income that you have or have lost. Um, I, you know, for you know, unemployment insurance, for example, there are many people that I know of who live in my district who have applied through the system and received a rejection, for example. So that would meet one of the criteria. But, you know, there are ways of showing, um, and kind of showing your eligibility for different programs that are an established um, part of the way that the community action um, agencies do their work and um, assist anti-poverty efforts across the state of Minnesota. Representative Albright. Mr. Chair, um, my next question would go to Ms. Mathis with regard to directing these uh, funds out to the grant grantees. Um, Ms. Mathis, uh, the bill stipulates up to a 10% uh, administrative cost. Um, I'm just wondering from the, the perspective of DHS, uh, what that would obligate your uh, agency to uh, in terms of does this obligate or would this give opportunity to uh, bring on uh, more uh, full-time people? Are you going to do this within uh, the rank and file that you've got? Could you explain how you intend to administer it? Ms. Mathis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, we, um, we don't envision that we, that DHS would need additional administrative capacity. Um, this is a, um, a system that we're used to working with and we have um, staff it, you know, it, it stretches a little bit, but not to the point of needing another staff person, I don't believe. So we would offer that 10% to uh, the community action agencies that are allowable up to 10%. They would take a look at, um, at what they're needing to do and, and in their application, they would put uh, what their administrative costs are likely to be. Mr. Chair, if you'll indulge me, I just have two follow-up questions. The first one is for uh, Representative Gomez. Uh, I did notice in uh, your last uh, committee stop in uh, jobs and economic development that uh, uh, the chair, as well as others, uh, moved it to, uh, rather than a, a program responsible under DEED, uh, to a Department of Health and Human Services. Um, I, I just, I guess I'm wondering, uh, I guess I know the answer in terms of why, but uh, I guess I'm surprised that it, uh, its path has landed in front of uh, Ways and Means and it didn't go to uh, HHS policy or HHS finance first. Representative Gomez. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Albright. Uh, yeah, so this is this is sort of unusual. You know, it is it's the end of session again. As I mentioned, um, you know, the intent here is to keep this as an option in the mix as uh, leadership determines end of session budget negotiations. So originally this was an appropriation um, from the deed commissioner. After discussion with the agencies and the administration, it was determined that, you know, because there is an urgency around getting this money into the hands of people quickly, which is why, again, we saw the federal government move with such swift action um, with the federal stimulus. Um, because getting these dollars circulating in our economy as soon as possible is really like uh, the, the way that, that um, these direct cash payments have the biggest impact. Um, you know, the decision was made to um, run them through the community action agency partnerships um, because of that, again, you know, because of the established relationship with DHS, their ability to move swiftly to get this money into the hands of folks who, who, uh, who really need it and can, can, uh, start, start spending the money. Um, so there were no further, uh, health and human services, uh, finance committees scheduled, and they had completed their work for the year by the time the determination was made to, um, change the path of the bill. And so, you know, working with, the um, the speaker's office and the chairs of of the committees impacted. It was decided that um, having the bill heard in this committee was uh, an acceptable um, substitute for a full HHS hearing um, in the last three days of session in a global pandemic. Representative Albright, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll just uh, finish with some comments. Um, well, I think uh, Representative Gomez, uh, the, the, the convenience of saying that uh, HHS finance or HHS policy uh, had closed up shop uh, with just three, uh, three days to go, certainly uh, um, is in stark contrast to what we heard on the floor yesterday from Representative and Chair, uh, Majority uh, uh, Leader Winkler about uh, proper vetting of bills. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that uh, in this case, we're kind of lining up a number of, uh, uh, of, of bills, uh, hoping to, to, to find uh, some funding when there is none. Um, this is a bill that uh, while its, its intent is, is laudable, uh, I think there are just too many uh, provisions in it that have not been properly vetted. I, I wish that this would have been brought to uh, any number of other committees um, this is a bill that certainly uh, needs proper vetting and it has not uh, been done so. So I'll be voting no. Okay, Representative Nora. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you to Representative Gomez for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I know for a fact there are so many families uh, who are struggling. Uh, they're struggling uh, because they didn't receive unemployment insurance. They didn't receive the stimulus check. Uh, for so many reasons that you articulated. Uh, I know many of the families are having uh, food insecurity, they're having economic insecurity and housing insecurity. Uh, those struggles are real. Uh, we know uh, because they call us. They, they, are part, they live in our districts. They live afar uh, from our districts. They're asking us uh, to act right now. You know, for those who are uh, in that precarious situation, uh, they can't afford to wait. Uh, we have left uh, too many behind as we go through the hardships caused by COVID-19. I think this is a, a good bill that addresses a challenge that many of our community members are experiencing. When it comes to the uh, COVID-19, we know that it's not the great equalizer because so many of the communities that have been left out are the ones who with low income, uh, people of color, indigenous. So this, this addresses a challenge that we have faced as a state. And I think it will be wise to be able to look into those struggles, as you mentioned, uh, mixed families, uh, youth who have been left out of their unemployment. The rent is due. Uh, so, so members, I, I, I allowed you to support this bill because it sends the right message and it provides the resources to those who need the most. And we need to be there for them. So we can afford to wait any longer. Uh, I think this is a good bill that needs to be uh, uh, included in our package as we 
end uh, uh, session uh, soon. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Representative Gomez. You're welcome, Representative Lieberling. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And some of what I wanted to say has been said so well by Representative Gomez and Representative Noor. I, I just, I always have to respond when I hear this falsehood about, oh, we have rich welfare benefits in the state. No, we don't have rich welfare benefits. So people who are on HHS committees now, I think, understand that we don't have rich welfare benefits, that the people who are getting welfare, which we now call MFIP and has been called that for, oh, at least maybe 30 years or something, that um, they get a very, very small amount of money and they are in deep poverty when they're on our programs and that most of these people are children. So I just have to speak up just to correct that falsehood that gets said again and again. It's just like, go back to that same old button and push it. It is false, false, false. Other than that, I just want to thank Representative Gomez for bringing this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Devney. Oh, we can't hear you, Representative Dabney. Because I hadn't unmuted yet. There we go. <laughs> there you are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank Representative Gomez for bringing this forward. I know I received a number of emails uh, as the federal government was working the, or after I should say, the federal government was working the CARES Act, where families who'd experienced layoffs uh, had bills coming in and had uh, older children discovered uh, to their kind of shock and amazement that under federal law, apparently a 16 year old is a child and a 17 year old is not. And even if that 17 year old had lost their job that they were using to save for college or to save for summer plans. Uh, I've had a 16 year old. I've got a 17 year old now. Uh, neither of them ate less when they were 17 years old than they did when they were 16. Uh, neither of them needed clothes any less. Neither of them uh, participated in community activities any less. Uh, but for reasons that I can't fathom, the federal government decided that a dependent 16-year-old was worthy of $500 to help that recipient family negotiate uh, the greatest recession we've seen since the Great Depression, but that family with a 17-year-old didn't need it. Uh, it makes no sense. And I think the state uh, stepping in where the federal government has yet again failed makes sense. I see this less as a question of uh, sympathy or, or such a like, and more a question of what sort of uh, what sort of economy do we want Minnesota to have? How quickly do we want to come out of this recession? And how broad-based uh, coming out of this recession do we want? Making sure that families have the needs, their needs met, as even the federal government identified those needs, but then failed them. And making sure that young people saving for college or saving for that first apartment uh, when they want to move out, um, as they were before, is about building our, our state's economy. It's about supporting our small businesses as well as our families. Uh, we certainly do have the option of cutting off our nose to spite our face. We've got a long history of doing that, uh, but I would counsel the committee not to do that. Thank you very much for, for bringing the bill forward. I hope as we meet these final days that we see the gaps uh, from the federal government and step in to fill those. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Vogel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Representative Gomez, for bringing it forward. I, I can understand the, the intent of what you're trying to do. I, but going back to uh, some of the questions that Representative Albright had asked, uh, when I go to line 1.9 and I see, to the extent practical, uh, grants shall be made so that an approximate equal dollar amount of grants are made to individuals in the metropolitan and the non-metropolitan area. How do you define the term practical and approximately? 
so that when these things are administered, people can go back and say, oh yeah, that's the amount that should have gone each place. Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Vogel, for the question. Um, so uh, to be honest, I think that like, you know, to the extent practicable could probably be omitted from this bill. Um, I, I believe that it's sort of a little bit of a holdover from the previous um, engrossment where it, it or the previous, for, you know, the bill is introduced when the idea was to um, have the appropriation come from the deed commissioner to the Minnesota Council on Foundations who had already established a grant to help folks who were falling through the cracks of the federal stimulus programs and unemployment. Um, because as I mentioned in my introductory comments, um, there's a formula in statute for disbursement of funds to the community action agencies across the state of Minnesota. And that takes into to account um, population and different um, indicators of poverty, um, a lot of stuff from the American Community Survey. And so, uh, the and the way that that allocation works out is roughly 50-50 between um, greater Minnesota and the metro area. Um, so again, I think like, you know, to the extent practicable could probably be taken out because since we're doing a formula instead, it really does end up pretty even. Representative Vogel. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one other question in that same paragraph um, on line 112, it refers to culturally specific populations. Uh, is there a definition for that? Or again, how would you allocate it? Or how would a, um, the person that's administering this know exactly what those organizations or populations would be? Representative Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Representative Gogol, Bogle. Sorry, <laughs> um, I guess it probably happens. Um, so th this language was included actually, like after we um, started the conversations with the community action agencies across the state of Minnesota, they explained to us um, the relationships that that they have um, with organizations that directly serve um, certain cultural populations in their geographies. Um, and, and that a lot of times the best way to uh, connect with those communities is through um, trusted agencies that, that specifically serve them. Um, and so they, have the, they already have established these relationships. Um, you know, for example, in, you know, in Worthington, there are a number of different languages and cultures represented there for various reasons. So, so that so the community action partnership that serves that area may um, partner with an organization that directly serves um, the Karen community or the Latino community um, in order to um, to kind of best get those resources into the hands of people who who need them, who maybe don't have a relationship directly with the community action partnership. And as I talked about in my, in my introductory statements and as Representative Noor um, spoke of, you know, the, this COVID is, is revealing underlying inequities in our systems and in our economy. Um, the, the, as we look across the country, um, people of color and indigenous people and immigrants and refugees are disproportionately impacted by the, by the, the this disease and also the economic impacts are disproportionately falling on low income people, service sector workers um, and and people of color and indigenous people. And you can see this borne out in the disparities in the in the unemployment rates um, if you disaggregate the data by race. Um, so this is really an attempt to to try to like try to target the resources that we do have to fill in these gaps to the folks who really who really need them. And so and so that requires us to be really thoughtful on the front end about how we're going to engage with communities that um, that maybe are not directly um, interacting with the community action agencies. Representative Vogel. Uh, well thank you, Mr. Chair. And and again, I, I'm not questioning the intent here, but I mean, I'm questioning the specifics and again, vetting this thing, you know, we've heard on the floor even that things have to be vetted before they can be brought out. 
And I, I just have a lot of questions on the subjectivity of some of this stuff that I, I think it needs more process before we allocate 50 or appropriate $50 million that we don't have. So uh, my suggestion would be that we run this back through the appropriate committees and make sure that everything is vetted so that it's carefully defined and, and, and can be implemented, uh, not again uh, against the intent, but to clearly state the intent so people know exactly where the money is going because we're taking $50 million of taxpayer money that we don't have and allocating it to something that we're not sure of. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Gomez. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chair, just quickly. Since, thank you, Mr. Chair. So since, since I'll just ask um, you any concluding comments because we're great. I think done with the people with questions. So Representative okay. Gomez. Sounds good. Just you know, since uh since you guys have quoted our majority leader, I want to quote your minority leader this week on the floor who said that, you know, around here, when you want to kill a bill, then you start talking process. So I, I, I totally respect what you're saying, but, you know, we're in, we are, we are where we are with this. So thank you. Um, well, I guess another hand has come up and it usually has the concluding uh, comments. Representative Garofalo. Um, minority thank you. Comments, I should say. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, um, are we going to be laying this bill over or are we um, voting on it today? We're uh, going to be voting on it uh, today. And as I mentioned uh, near the beginning of the meeting, when uh, we uh, first talked a bit about process, we're down to the last few days. And uh, that's why it went from the Jobs Committee directly to uh, Ways and Means. And uh, the goal is to um, have uh, the uh, issues that were described by Representative Gomez to be part of the end of session uh, discussions so that uh, the needs of this population group are on the table for discussions and uh, yet to be determined just how we'll be able to respond because we all know that we have some difficult decisions ahead. But I'm sure that the um, as Bill had a place at the table. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, my apologies. My dog Sorry. is barking in the background. He's That's sharing his opinions on the bill. We apparently. have dogs and everything with this new technology. So understand, Representative Garofalo. Sorry, I just had no, a command. He's for it. <laughs> and technology oh. breakdowns, I should say. So we've had everything. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would just say uh, that uh, I'll be voting no on this bill um, and that floor time at the end of a legislative session is precious. And uh, I would hope that the majority sees in their wisdom to not calendar this bill on the floor. Um, if the Senate, I don't like speaking for the Senate Republicans, but on this one I do, I can confidently say that if this bill were ever to become law, uh, with Senate Republicans voting for it, I would jump from the top of the Capitol bill. So I don't know, maybe that'll make them sign off on the bill. So I'll be voting no, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to make a, a comment. Uh, you know, I've been in the legislature 48 years. My parents are deceased. And I was asked many times, uh, how did you develop your political philosophy? Uh, who are your political heroes? You know, a lot of people respond with the name of a major political figure or a major uh, religious person or something like that as being their hero. I've always responded, my mom and dad. And so pardon me for a minute, but <clears throat> they're both gone. They were products of the depression. And my dad called me on very few political issues. But on an issue like this, he would call me and he'd say, Lyndon, remember the children. And if I saw an article in the paper, I knew before the day was out, I would get a call from my dad because they had a very hard time during the depression. My grandmother was a single parent raising four boys and they had nothing. He remembered that. He had a good job. He saw to it that his kids never went without. The worst situation we might have would be they'd have to wait for payday. But if we really needed it even sooner, 
he found the resources. So we were well taken care of, but his political philosophy came out of the depression. And we are right now in a depression. We need to help these people. So with that, um, Ms. Sparkman, take the roll. Representative Carlson. Aye. Mr. Chair, do we have to restate the motion? Do we do that? Uh, you're correct. I got caught up in my own comments. Uh, Representative Olson, if you could restate the motion. Mr. Chair, I renew my motion that House File 4611, the first engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the motion is uh, before us. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Ms. Parkman, if you could take the roll. Representative Carlson. Aye. Carlson, aye. Representative Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo. No. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright. No. Albright, no. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Davids. No. Davids, no. Representative Davney. Aye. Davney, aye. Representative Driskowski. No. Driskowski, no. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton. No. Hamilton, no. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman. Aye. Hausman, aye. Representative Hertos. No. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Kresha. No. Kresha, no. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly. Aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Long. Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt, excused. Representative Nelson. Most definitely, yes. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor. Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Representative Poppy. Aye. Poppy, aye. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Scott. No. Scott, no. Representative Torkelson. No. Torkelson, no. Representative Vogel. No. Vogel, no. Representative Wiginius. Yes. Wiginius, <laughs> aye. 17 ayes, 11 nays. Okay, the motion uh, carries and the bill is on its way to the general orders. Um, thank you, Representative Gormas. And uh, tomorrow we uh, reconvene the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Ms. Conley, did we de finally decide at 9 o'clock or 8.30? I'm not sure what you posted. Uh, we posted 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. Okay, we will uh, reconvene then tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock. With that, uh, meeting adjourned.